to Kingdom Come Ministries, where our leaders are Apostle William Rogers Jr. and Pastor Dr. Donna Rogers. Our prayer is that as you listen to today's message, you let the Spirit of God use the Word of God to transform your life. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. God for you. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them it's good seeing you in the house. Look on somebody next to you, close to you. Let them know it's good. <laughs> Could have been anywhere else, but you're here. And we also thank God for our virtual members. Let's give it up for our virtual members. Let's go to the gospel according to St. Luke. We're looking at chapter 13. We're looking at verses 6 through verses 9. The new covenant the NLT version and it says then Jesus told this story a parable to illustrate a truth a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it but he was always disappointed finally he said to his gardener I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig cut it down it's just taking up space in the garden the gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. And if not, then you can cut it down. You may be seated in this place. Now, Father, I pray that your word shall not return back unto you a void, but that it will accomplish everything that you sent it to do. So closing out this series, I want us to make sure we understand the word fruit is often used in the scriptures to denote results or that which is produced. The language is taken from the fact that a man reaps or gathers the fruit or results of that which he plants. The Bible allows us to know, do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. The Bible says, for whatsoever, whatever that thing is, whatever you plant, uh, that and that only is what you're going to reap, you're going to harvest. And so we've been talking about fruit is used in several ways to speak of our productivity. Thus we speak of punishment as the fruit of sin, poverty as the fruit of idleness and happiness as the fruit of a virtuous life. A woman 
for example, who is pregnant. The Bible speaks about the fruit of her womb, the production or the producing of life that is developing inside of her. Please go with me to the 127th division of Psalms, and we want to look at verse 3. The Old Covenant, the Amplified Version, it says, Behold, children are a heritage and gift from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. And when the Bible speaks about productive work and employment, it speaks about the fruit of the labor of our hands, what our work has produced. Let's stay right there in Psalms. Let's go to the 128th division. Looking at verses 1 through verse 2, the Old Covenant, the Amplified Version. It says, blessed, happy, and sheltered by God's favor is everyone who fears the Lord and worship him with obedience, who walks in his ways and lives according to his commandments. And then verse 2 tells us, For you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You will eat what your hands has worked for. You will be happy and blessed, and it will be well with you. And when... The Bible speaks about offerings. It speaks about the fruit of our giving. Please go with me to the book of Romans. And we're looking at chapter 15. And we're looking at verses 26 through verse 28. The new covenant, the new King James Version. And it says, for it pleased those from Macedonia and a cheer to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, When I, Apostle Paul says, have performed this and have sealed it to them after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, this contribution, this money, I shall go by way of you to Spain. One of the things I want you to understand about our fruit when it comes to giving, when we take of our finances, please hear me, your tithes, your offerings, your debt retirement funds, your investing in, in mission work. When we take of our finances and invest them in the kingdom of God, we are banking with God. And the result of us banking with God is fruit to our account. Don't you ever feel like when you give, It's not going to be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God's going to make sure somebody give back into your bosom. So we have to understand when we talk about where's the fruit, the scripture talks about different types of fruit. Please go with me to the book of Philippians. And we're looking at chapter 4, looking at verses 15 through verses 19, the new covenant, the new King James Version. And it says here, now you Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I, this is Apostle Paul, he's still talking to these different churches, departed from Macedonia, no church, not a one that I established, not a one that I went to to minister at, not a one that I cared about, Share with me concerning the matter of giving and receiving, but you only. Now he's giving recommendation to the Philippian church. Now, you have to understand now that the Philippian church was not a wealthy church. Because a lot of times people feel like I can't give because I don't have enough. And you will never have enough if you don't learn how to give. I'm going to talk to you today as we talk about this fruit. In fact, it was a poverty-stricken church at that time. But they still supported Apostle Paul financially, even though he was 800 miles away from them. So now he's telling them, look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. 
Not that I seek the monetary gift. This is what he said. But I seek the fruit, the accumulated interest that abounds, that increases to your account. I need to share something else with you today. God pays interest. And you have to understand this. Because if we start looking at our giving as that fruit that we're giving to God, you got to realize there's seed in that fruit that we give. And Jesus says it like this. He says, a hundredfold will be returned to him who gives for the gospel's sake. A hundredfold is 10,000% interest. So when I give, I'm not looking for that 30, that 60. I'm looking for that 100-fold. I'm looking for that 10,000% interest. How many of you is looking for that as well as I am? You, you, you have to understand this. I don't know no bank. If you know anything about investment, you know anything about money, you know <laughs> anything about banking, I don't know no bank in the world that will give you that type of rate. Somebody say only God. So we're understanding now that giving benefits, the giver as well as the receiver receives. The Philippian church giving of their money was like an investment with God, who as their banker added interest to their bank account. So look at what verse 18 says. Indeed, this is what Paul is saying, I have all and abound. In other words, thank you. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your seeds. Thank you for your sowing. He says, I'm now lacking nothing. I am full, having received from Ephroditus the things, the gifts sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, a sweet fragrance of incense offering, an acceptable sacrifice, an act of worship well-pleasing to God. In other words, when we give our finances into the kingdom of God, that's like a smell of fresh aroma to God. And he is well pleased. Are you hearing me? And he is well pleased. He smell your offering. Oh, my God. He, he smell it when you give it. And you're not forced to do that. Through their sacrificial offerings, Paul has more than enough. And they too will have more than enough because God will repay them. So he says here in verse 19, this verse 19 is a, is a verse in the scripture which I have heard all down through the years. And you probably have heard it and you like it. And you like to quote it. It says, and my God, can, can we read that together? Let's read it. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, according to his abundant wealth. Because God bank don't go bankrupt. He has unlimited resources. Now, but, but before I can move on there, something caught my attention here. God says he will meet all your need. Is that what that says? And my God shall supply, do it say all your need? Do we see that? Somebody say, all my need. So then why do you have a need? If the Bible says here that God shall supply all your need. It didn't say needs. It said need. Then why do you have a need? Because God's promise is based on the premises of giving. Please listen to me. Many want to take the promises of verse 19. And my God shall apply all of my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Oh, that's just a familiar verse that we quote. And we like quoting that. But that verse there, it deals with the premises of the people that gave to the apostle Paul and met the need of the church. Okay, okay. Are you still here? We, 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 we want to take the promise of verse 19 and apply it to our lives while avoiding the premises of verses 15 through verse 18. We don't get an interest if we don't make an investment. 
Okay, I'm still talking to you. We cannot claim verse 19 unless we're doing what verse 18 talk about. If you're not a tither and you don't like to give and you don't like to sow into nobody's life and you don't like to give to the kingdom of God or pay anything, you use your money on whatever it is you want to use your money on and that's your business. But you ain't going to get no interest from God like that. Okay, okay, okay. And the thing I love about the interest from God because that fruit have seed in it. And so he's going to give it back 10,000%. Do you understand the words that's coming out of my mouth? You, you, you have to understand this. We, we, we pray to God. God bless me with this, and God bless me with that, and, and God provide for me here, and God open the door here. And when we have the opportunity to give into the kingdom of God, we come up with every excuse. My cell phone got to be paid, and this got to be paid, and that got to be paid. Mine do too. Hello? Your neighbors do too. Look at your neighbor. Y'all nod your head at them if your bills need to be paid too. Yeah, but God always come first. Okay, okay. God always comes first. And if you are in a predicament and you don't see a 10,000% or you don't see things coming to you multiplied or your tents enlarging, if you don't see that, that's because you did not follow the premises of verses 15 through verse 18. Our money, that's fruit. Every time we have an opportunity, we should be sowing our money. That's fruit. Now, you don't mind people sowing into your life. Blessed quietness. You don't mind people giving to you. You don't mind people giving into your bank account. You don't not mind people helping pay your cell phone bill or your mortgage or your rent or putting gas in your car or buying your children's shoes and you buying your children's clothes or taking you to get your nails done and your feet done and all of the above. I'm in the house. You don't mind that. But when it comes time to sow into the kingdom of God, God had a problem. With the people when you were so busy taking care of your house, decorating your house, putting furniture in your house, making sure everything was taken care of for your house and your cars in the garage and your boat sitting on the water. He had a problem with that and then you didn't want to give to the kingdom of God. That's why you're in the condition that you're in. Okay. Okay. I wish I had a match. I light a firework and throw it out at you. You, you, you have to understand this. Somebody say, my money is considered fruit to the Lord. And when I give, he is going to add to my bank account. Now, bless God right there. <laughs> uh, Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I, I kind of can stay right there. Uh, I'm trying to close this out, but I kind of can stay right there because we want to be examples in everything else but examples in our giving. We want to be examples in everything else, and we want everybody to see us and follow us. No, follow the way I sow. Are you hearing me? Follow the way I give my tithes and my offerings. Don't just follow the way I dress and the way I sling my hair. Follow the way I give my offerings. Are you hearing me? Y'all kind of quiet in here today, but it's okay. You know I'm going to teach anyway. You do know pastor going to teach anyway. You do know I'm going to teach it anyway. <laughs> Ah, long as you know it, long as you know it. <laughs> and so we have to understand this. When the Bible speaks about our praise to God, it speaks of the fruit of our lips, what our worship is expressing and producing. Please go to me to the book of Hebrews. We're looking at chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 15, the New Covenant, the Amplified Version. And so it says here, through him, Therefore, let us at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, 
which is the fruit of lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. See, one of the things you have to understand when we're offering up praise and worship to God, we're offering up fruit to the Lord. How are you offering that up? Come on now. The, the, our praise and worship don't depend on the team standing up here. Because they ain't been through what I've been through. They don't know what I need. They don't know what I've experienced all week long. So my praise and worship cannot be predicated on them. It has to be predicated on me knowing how good God is and how faithful God is and how grateful God is and how I love him and how I praise him and how I adore him. So when it comes time for praise and worship, the fruit of my lips, I'm offering up this fruit to God. Are you hearing me? You don't stand in the house when praise and worship going on with your lips shut. Open your mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall be continually in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exhort his name together. Do I have any praisers in the house? Anybody want to praise God? Give God a shout in this place. Come on now. You, you people don't know what we've been through. People don't know what we dealt with. People don't know the eviction notice you may have gotten. People don't know you're going through a divorce. People don't know you can't find your child. People don't know your son been murdered. People don't know what you're dealing with. And I'm going to come to the house of God with my mouth shut, depending on you to get prayed. The devil is a liar. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise that shall continually be in my mouth. Please don't stop my praise. Don't stop my praise. Whatever you do, don't stop my praise. Don't stop me from praising God. Don't stop me from clapping my hands. Don't stop me from stumping my feet. Don't stop me from lifting my voice. I will bless him at all times. I will bless God at all times. I will bless God at all times. I will bless God at all times. I'll bless him. I'll bless him. Listen, let me help you out. Let, 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 let me help you out. You, 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 you have to understand when we deal with this fruit, I need you to hear me and hear me well. My fruit is not predicated that I give to God. It's not predicated on any music. You ain't ever have to play. My, my worship is not predicated on you singing a song. My worship is predicated on how good God is to me. I just thought I'd let you know that. I just thought I'd let you know that. You, 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 you have to understand when I think of the goodness of Jesus. Shh, when I think about how good God's been. <laughs> when I think about the enemy said no, but God says yes. When I think about how they tried to keep the door shut, but God opened the door. When I think about how God is pushing us out of this place into our new place. When I think about how good God is, make me want to throw my hands up in the air. Make me want to wave them like I just don't care. And give God praise in this place. Are you hearing me? You got to understand that. You got to understand that. You, you, you have to understand this. I will bless him at all times. The words of praise from our lips that come from our heart. This is fruit unto God. I'm giving this unto God. I ain't doing this for you. This is not for you. This is for God. Are you hearing me? Fruit have three characteristics. Three. Three. Let's get this. The first characteristic is fruit is always visible. It is something you can see. Fruit is, is, is not invisible that you can't see it. Please go with me to the book of Galatians. And we're looking at chapter 5. 
and we're looking at verses 22 through verses 23, the new covenant, the amplified version. And the word of the Lord says, but the fruit, somebody say fruit of the Holy Spirit, the result of his presence within us is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such, there is no law. And so, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, and hopefully you'll catch it. The fruit of God have seed in it. And so, from one fruit, seed come forth from that. So, when the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, uh, maybe you didn't know that love got seeds to in it. So, love produce love. Your love don't diminish. It don't stop growing. You don't become a Christian and talk about, well, I used to love like that, but I don't love like that no more. No, that love got seed in it, and it continues to grow, and you continue to evolve, and you continue to grow more love and more joy and more peace. Do we understand that? And guess what? This, this fruit here ain't invisible. It's fruit that can be seen. People can see your love. They can see your kindness and your goodness. These are the manifestations of this fruit. Actually, we can see evidence of this in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. And we're looking at verses 8 through verse 9, the new covenant, the new King James Version. Are you still here? And it says here in verse 8, Paul says, for you were once darkness. Hello? Hello? I said we was once darkness, okay. But now you are light in the Lord. So you know when you're in dark, it's something that really can't be seen. But when you turn on the light, you can see it. Then it says walk, live as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit or the light is in all goodness. That's love and action and righteousness, rightness of character and truth. And the second characteristic is fruit always bears the character of the tree of which it is a part. When you go to an apple tree, you're going to see apples. You're not going to see oranges. You're not going to see bananas. Please go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthew. And we're looking at chapter 7, looking at verses 17 through verses 20, the new covenant, the new King James Version. And the word of the Lord says, even so, every good tree bears, produces good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. Am I in the book? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, by what they produce, you will know them. So it doesn't matter. The fruit of our lives, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it proves what's on the inside of our heart. I'm going to say that again. And I want you to get it real clear. It doesn't matter whether the fruit is good or whether the fruit is bad. What it does is reveal what's in our hearts. Every word, every action, all of that, that comes from our heart. And John gives us a good commentary on Jesus' word. Please go with me to 1 John. We're looking at chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 9 as we move further into the lesson, trying to close this series out. The New Covenant, the NIV version, and it says, No one who is born of God will continue. You see that? Habitually practice to sin. No one who is born of God because we give our lives to the Lord and and we have to process and we have to evolve and a lot of things we're not used to and a lot of our habits and a lot of generational curses we we still embrace why because we haven't allowed the spirit of God to use the word of God to start flushing all of that stuff out of us So, yes, we have given our life to the Lord. We have confessed the Lord Jesus, and we have given our life to the Lord. But we still... 
still have some things lingering, some residue, some stuff going on in our life. And so sometimes, please hear me with a clarity, because sometimes we do sin not knowing that we're sinning. Hello? Hello? But once the Holy Spirit begins to develop you, and mature you, and grow you, and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away, and behold, all things has become new. You will not continue to habitually sin. Okay. Are you hearing me? You won't. You, you won't. I want to strengthen and encourage the new converts and the new believers. Because a lot of time you get saved and, and you you just so used to doing things by habit, you continue to do stuff and then you catch yourself and say, oh, 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 no, 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 no. But this is the reason why the Bible says no one who is born of God will continue habitually practice the sin. Why? Because God's seed, meaning truth which is implanted in the heart, remains in them, they cannot continue to habitually sin because they have been born of God. Do we understand that? That's the reason why you have to keep moving forward. Even though you're struggling with generational curses or whatever things you're struggling with, you have to continue to move forward. There are some seasons the enemy like to attack you in. Some of you can't live saved through the summer. And it's always summer in Florida. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are some seasons that the enemy like to attack you with. You know, when it comes to family reunions, you struggle. There's certain seasons the enemy like to attack you with. When you by yourself and you're not in rela a relationship with nobody, you struggle. There are some seasons that the enemy like to attack you with. When you're going through a dark place or a cloudy place, even though I told you when you're going through a dark place and a cloudy place, you feel like you've been buried alive, God just planted you in a new season for you to come up out of that. Are you hearing me? But you have to understand this. You have to understand this. And the third characteristic is fruit never exists for itself. And I'm going to close out today with this. It never exists for itself. Fruit by nature benefits others and can be used to grow new plants. This referred to bringing men to the knowledge of Christ. Fruit never exists for itself. Please go with me to the gospel according to St. John. We're looking at chapter 15, looking at verse 16, the new covenant, the amplified version. Good teaching, amen? amen. So it says here, you have not chosen me. I, I, I know that you think you chose me, but I actually chose you. That's why the sperm hit the egg and you came into the earth and you wasn't aborted or miscarried because I chose you. You didn't choose me. He says, but I have chosen you, and I just didn't choose you. I appointed and placed and purposefully planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing. And that your fruit will remain and be lasting so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name as my representative, he will give it to you. I chose you to bear fruit. I chose you to bear fruit. That's what I chose you to do. Now, I need us to understand this because it says here, I chose you so that you would go. Somebody say go. go. The go in his command makes it clear that this fruit bearing cannot be limited to the fruit of the spirit, the internal fruit that we're supposed to produce in our spirit because you ain't going nowhere producing that. But when he says, so you will go, and bear fruit. The charge to go and bear fruit is referring here to the fruit born by our Christian influence upon other people's lives. Who see you? Who know you've been born again? How many souls do you talk to? 
How many times you on purpose intentionally make sure you go out of your way to minister to somebody? That's what he chose us for. I called you and I chose you. You know, I've been in ministry for a long time and I've heard a lot of things. And I'm always hearing, God called me and God called me to preach. And God called me to do this. And Pastor, God called me to do this. And Pastor, don't overlook the gift of God on my life. And Pastor, God said, uh, let me tell you the first thing he called you to do, bear fruit. Okay, I said it on that side. Let me, say, let me tell you the first thing he called you to do, bear fruit. Amen. He told you to go yes. Yes. and bear fruit. And I want your fruit to remain. Stay with me now. Go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthews. Let's look at chapter 28, verses 19 through verse 20, the new covenant, the amplified version. Because we are all anointed to our generation. And there are people that's locked up in us that God want us to win. Are you hearing me? But you can't win souls if you're selfish. So after Jesus' resurrection from the dead and just before he ascended back into heaven, listen to what he said. Verse 19, go therefore, that will that go again, and make disciples. What do you mean disciples? Learners, students of all nations. Don't be prejudiced with your going. Don't be prejudiced with your salvation. Don't have your picks and chooses. So this is what he says. Go therefore and make disciples, learners, students of all nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my word. It has nothing to do with us. One plant, another water. He give the increase. He get the glory. Has nothing to do with the one that planted or the one that watered. It has to do with God so he can be glorified. Are you hearing me in this place on today? I don't mean to get loud with it, but you, you, you have to understand. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we did last Sunday. That's the reason why I asked the questions. Do you believe that he is the Son of God? Do you believe that he has risen? Do you believe that he is alive? Do you believe that? Are you now a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ? I now baptize you in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what he's talking about. He says, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. He chose us. Somebody said, I'm, I'm chosen to bear fruit. To bear fruit. Now, you, you don't ever have to feel like you rejected and kicked to the side and all that. No, God chose you, and he chose you for a purpose. You need to understand discipleship is that developmental process that progressively bring Christians from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity because some are saved, they just ain't mature. Okay. Some are saved. They just ain't developed and they're not matured. It's not that you're not a Christian. You're just not a mature Christian yet. So you need hands on you to help teach you and, and, and mentor you and, and, and develop you. This is what he's saying here. And you can't leave somebody that's being mentored to themselves. You got to do life with people so they can come up out of them generational curses and everything they've been bound by. You got to do life with them. They just don't get saved. You just don't give birth to a baby and then leave a baby to themselves and expect that baby to feed itself and change itself and all of that. No, it will kill itself because it has no knowledge. So what you have to do when you're discipling people, you're taking them from spiritual infancy. You're just a babe. I don't care how old you are. If you've just given your life to the Lord, you're being taken from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. 
Why? But there's a purpose in that too. Why am I spending time with you? Why am I impartening you? Why am I training you? Why am I praying for you? Why am I dealing with you? Why am I rebuking you? Why am I chastising you so you can mature and turn around and train somebody else? But you know how we do. We get saved. We come to the Lord, and it's just all about us. We don't want to help bring nobody else to the Lord Jesus. We don't want to help disciple nobody else. We don't want to take time out with people. But did not somebody take time out with you? Is somebody still taking time out with you? That's what discipleship is. Is is after we've been saved and after we've been delivered and after God is changing us, then we have our hands on somebody else to do the same for them. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. We're looking at verses 13 through verses 15. I'm trying to help you bring forth some fruit. So it says here in the New Covenant, the Amplified Version, says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that many times I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. So that I may have some fruit of my labor among you, even as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. This is the Apostle Paul. He was telling the other church, listen, I plan on coming to you. I want to come to you because I need some fruit for my labor. I don't want my labor to be in vain. I don't want to live this Christian life. And the only thing I have on my resume and my record is I came to church every Sunday. We dance. We shout it. We praise God. I don't have no jewels in my crown. I don't have no souls on my resume. Who did you win? Um, it why your resume so short? Um, you don't have nothing. The apostle Paul was saying, listen, I wanted to come to you because I need some fruit there. The apostle Paul really didn't go and establish churches where churches was already established. He wanted to establish churches where nobody knew God or believed in God or nothing like that. You know, we, we, we like to, after people have come to the house of God and, and after they have gotten saved and all of that, we, we like to smother them instead of going out, going into the hedges and the highways and compelling people to come. We like the Lord over people. Lord over other people fruit. That ain't your fruit. That ain't your fruit. <laughs> oh my God. That ain't your fruit. That ain't your fruit. I come to ask you a question today. Where's the fruit? You like the way I'm teaching today? Where your fruit? Ask your neighbor, where your fruit? Who did you help get delivered from drugs? Who did you help get healed from a heartbreak? Who did you help get healed when they was evicted? Who did you help when they came out of prison? Who did you help putting gas in their car when they were stuck on the side of the road? Where is your fruit? This... This, this is all he was saying. Because people are caught up in life and life situations and they struggle. And guess what? Everybody don't want to be there. Some people are battling their father's demons. Some are battling their mother's demons. Some are battling their ancestors' problems. And the things that they had to battle with. They don't want to battle that stuff. And instead of we helping people, we talk about people. Instead of we pray for people, we judging people. Instead of us being there to make sure people are okay, we want to make sure we constantly beat them down. I'm talking to you today. Are you hearing me? The apostle Paul, one of his purposes for going to Rome is he wanted to have fruit among the Romans. I want my crown to be full of jewels, red rubies and, 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 and emeralds and, and pearls. Oh, my. Yes. All kind. Why? Because you take the time. Listen to me. You take the time to talk to people because people mentals are all over the place. People are struggling and, and, and they go. Yet yeah, they smile in your face, but they cry when you turn from them. They going through. They, they have 
problems, they want to know why. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? Why am I dealing with this? Why wasn't I accepted? Why was I rejected? Why do I have to go through this? They have problems. And we have to be able to help snatch that soul from the hand of the enemy. Snatch that soul before they commit suicide. Snatch that soul before they kill themselves. Snatch that soul and let them know God still love you. Weary, wounded, and sad, he love you. Bloops and blunders, he loves you. Generational curses, he loves you. Making mistakes, he love you. Smoking on the pipe, he love you. Hoeing around, he love you. Robbing banks, he love you. We need to let the people know God love them. Put your hands together and let them know that God love them. Come on, bless God in this place. So, let me, let me hurry up here. The fruit Paul had in mind was souls. He wasn't talking about the fruit you eat. Paul previously had success among the Gentiles, and he wanted to continue to reach those who were not Jewish. You know, we, we, we just like to get stuck in our own culture. And he told them to just kind of spread it out. Have you even evangelized your neighborhood? Do you know who your next door neighbor is? Do you know who live on the right side of you, the left side of you, in front of you, across the street from you, around the corner from you? People see you walk around the neighborhood, they're going to want to know, who are you in the neighborhood? That's a grand opportunity right there. So he says here in verse 14, are you still here? He says in verse 14, I have a duty, an obligation to perform and a debt to pay both to Greeks and to barbarians, the culture and the unculture, both to the wise and to the foolish. He says, so for my part, I am ready, prepared and eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. He had a deep burden for souls. What has happened to the believers is now we don't have a burden for people anymore. We don't have a burden for souls no more. It's, it's, it's so easy for us to walk by people and kick them and spit on them. And it's so easy for us to say negative things instead of positive things. We don't have a burden for souls anymore. A burden is a motivation, a pull or a push against us that get us to do what doesn't come naturally. It is having a heart that is broken over the lostness of people's souls. When I see people in the conditions that they are in, I right then begin to intercede and pray. God, touch that heart, touch that mind. T touch them. A lot of times you ain't got to always be laying hands on people. Spirits transfer. I don't want people always laying hands on me. I don't know what's in your spirit. And I already battling. I don't need to battle from what you put on me. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the reason why the laying on of hands have really lost the essence because now everybody just want to do it. There was a reason and there was a purpose for why we do this. And when I see people in certain conditions, I begin to intercede and pray for them. I begin to pray for the nations and the nations of the world. I begin to pray for people that's lost and people that's going through, the people in Ukraine, the people in Russia, and begin to, we don't have a burden for souls no more because we so selfish. Think about me, myself, and I, what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. And God has been good to you. With all your problems, he has been good to you. Do I have a witness in this place? God has been good to you. And so this is what he was saying. Paul, he had a burden for souls now. I watch the people that come up in this house. I'm supposed to. I don't, I don't wanna, want, want you to be fearful of me or anything, but i supposed to. Because when I see you, I know what to pray for without even talking to you and dealing with you. I know how to begin to break those soul ties and break those bands of wickedness and, and break those generational curses and all of that that you're battling. But we don't have a burden for soul. We don't care about people no more. And if we as the believers, as the Christian, as the church don't care about people, then who's supposed to care for them? Are you hearing me? 
So please go with me to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through verse 3. I have a couple of more scriptures and I'm closing. Thank you for listening attentively. The New Covenant, the Amplified Version. It says, I, Apostle Paul, am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me, enlightened and prompted by the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. He had a burden for souls. Whether we see people come in the worship center or not, do you care? Do you check on them? He had a burden for souls. Then he says here in verse 3, For if it were possible, I would wish that I myself were a curse, separated, banished from Christ, for the sake of the salvation of my brothers, my natural kinsmen. In other words, the apostle Paul, he had a burden and it was so heavy. In other words, he was saying, I wish I could take place with you and go to hell instead of you. That's just how concerned he was. We come week after week after week after week. We have Sunday worship service. We have Wednesday night Zoom. We have Thursday night prayer live. We have Saturday intercessory prayer. And out of the whole week, how many people have you stopped and ministered to and witnessed to and showed your concern for? Or are you just too selfish when you was down? Was anybody there? No, Pastor, wasn't nobody there. No, that's not true. God is always there. And so we have to understand this. He cared so much, he thought about replacing himself with his brethren, the Jewish people, that was headed to hell because they hadn't received the Lord Jesus. Please go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthew's chapter 9. We're looking at verse 35 through verses 38, the new covenant, the TLB version. And it says, Jesus traveled around through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the Jewish synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And wherever he went, he healed people of every sort of illness. And what pity he felt for the crowds that came because their problems were so great and they didn't know what to do or where to go for help. They were like sheep without a shepherd. So in other words, we need to see as Jesus saw. We need to feel as Jesus felt. And then we need to do what Jesus did. Because Jesus had his disciples with him. And he's seen all of these people. And his disciples didn't see nothing. But when he saw them, he seen they had problems. He seen they were bruised. They were wounded. They were hurt. What do you see when you see people? He could have seen anything else. He could have said, oh, these people ain't nothing but sinners. Oh, these people is nasty and they filthy and they trifling. He could have said, oh, these people will never be nothing. They'll never become them nothing. They'll never do nothing. That's not what Jesus saw. When Jesus saw them, he said, they're wounded, they're bruised, they're hurt. They need a shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He saw differently. His perspective was differently. When you talk to people at the grocery store, when you see people on your job, can you tell me what you see? Because sheep can get turned over on their backs and not able to get up by themselves again. They flail in the air with their legs, but they can't get back on their feet without the aid of a shepherd. And left in this condition, helpless, and vulnerable to their enemies, they're going to eventually die. Are you hearing me? Can't even get up. Want to get up. Can't get up. Life is beating them up. Generational curses is struggling them. They're lying. They're polluted in their own blood. Want to come out. Can't come out. Needing help. Even though it's not saying it with his voice, it's saying it with his life. Can somebody help me? I can't get up. I'm struggling. I'm caught up in the worst things in life. Is anybody able to hear me? Can anybody hear me? People are hurting and they want to get up. They want to do better, but they need somebody to help them do better. Are you hearing me? This is a picture of the lost soul apart from the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Outwardly, 
They may look calm and comfortable. They may be successful in worldly terms, but their legs up, unable to help themselves from their sins. That's how sinners are. You looking at them, getting jealous of them, wanting to be like them, not knowing they land on their back, about to die because they don't have a shepherd in their life. They don't have nobody to teach them. They don't have nobody to embrace them. They don't have nobody to love them. They don't have nobody to help them get up on their feet. So they go to different things to cope with in life. And here you are standing up on your feet with the Lord who is your shepherd and you shall not want. And you're not even helping them get up on their feet. Are you hearing me? Somebody say legs up. They going to die if I don't help them. Say it again. Legs up. They going to die if I don't help them. Say it again. Legs up. My family going to die. If I don't help them, say it, legs up. Sinners is going to die if I don't help them. That's all that is. Struggling. I know, I know you looking at me and think I got all it all together. That's what they saying. I know you hating on me and you jealous of me because I got things. But I'm struggling in my mind. I have no peace. I can't rest at night. I'm warring. I'm battling. You looking at my exterior and you can't see my interior. They going to die. The people in your family, they going to die if you don't reach out to help them. People that you don't know on your job, at the bus stop. They gonna die at the gas station if you don't help them. If you can smoke with them, you can help them. You hearing me? You ain't too young. You're not too young. There are young men locked up in you. You're not too young. Are y'all hearing me? The millennials, they need you. They need to know it's okay. You done fail. You done made a mistake. It's okay. Tell them, get up. But if your mouth's shut and you ain't saying nothing to nobody, I want you to keep looking at that sheep. Because he can't lay there like that. Too much longer, he going to die. And while you just thinking about yourself and being considerate of yourself and I want this and I want that and I want my own. Listen, all you got to do, as we said, is so and God will supply all of your need. You, you, you ain't got to worry about that. When you take care of God's business, he going to take care of yours. Can you put a praise right there? Can you put a praise right there? I got to bring this to a close. So he says here in verse 37, the harvest is so great. There is great opportunity for people to receive the gospel and respond to it. Because it's the objective of the enemy for the people not to know the truth. It's the objective of the enemy for you to let people know you go to a worship center and you somewhere acting crazy. And then they be saying, I don't want your God. It's the objective of the enemy to cause people to be blind and make people think that the word of God is not relevant today and it won't help them. That's the objective of the enemy. But Jesus says the harvest is so great. It's plenteous. The problem is the tongue talkers. Are you hearing me? The problem is the Bible carriers. The phone carriers, the ones that quote the word and preach the word, the ones that lay hands on people. The problem is the laborers are few. That's talking about us. Few. The problem, it ain't that there ain't souls for you to win. There's souls. There's souls for you to win. There's souls for you to win. There's souls for everybody up in here to win. But pastor, I don't know enough word. You know enough to win that soul. But pastor, I don't. No, no, no. Jesus saying it's not the harvest. It's us's. 
ain't leaving none of us out. He said, the, 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 it's not the harvest. It's all kind of sinners out there. All kind of sinners in your family. All kind of sinners living in your neighborhood. All kind of sinners on your job. All kind of sinners at the bank. All kind of sinners when you're doing drugs. Oh, oh, how did that get her? Okay. All kind. He said the harvest is great. It's the laborers. It's the ones that come to the worship center every Sunday and lift their hands and be crying and speaking in tongue and having us standing on our feet for hours and, and all of that. It's, it's, it's the labors. It's the one that do all this. And, and uh, where your fruit at? It's the labors. It's the la Don't go ghost on me now. It's the labors. He says, no, 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 no. Why is there a labor shortage? Because we don't see like Jesus see, and we don't care like he cares. We thank God for that word. Now it's time to show our gratitude to God through giving. The word of God reminds us in 2 Corinthians 9 and 6 that the one who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So we prepare for our generous crop as we sow our financial seeds in faith today. To all of our virtual members, we are so glad to have you as a part of KCM, and we want to get to know you more. Would you please send us your contact information to kcmtampafl at gmail.com so that we can stay connected. We look forward to meeting you real soon.